Consider this excerpt from a letter to Nathan Baruch, dated August 7th, 1968. Quote, The spiritual master must be bona fide representative of Krishna by disciplic succession, receiving orders from the superior, and the disciple must agree to abide by the orders of the spiritual master. This is the simple method of spiritual advancement. If you remember this principle, it will be very nice." Unquote. This excerpt is from a letter written to a prospective disciple very early in Prabhupada's movement, just as it was taking off in the important summer of 1968. In other words, he stated the chief principle right from the beginning, quote, the spiritual master must be bona fide representative of Krishna by disciplic succession, receiving orders from the superior, unquote. If Prabhupada was referring to Lord Chaitanya, he would not describe Lord Chaitanya as, quote unquote, the superior. Sure, Lord Chaitanya was in the disciplic succession ten centuries ago, and as such, he is still integral to it. But he would have been described as the Supreme Lord, not merely as, quote-unquote, the superior. Obviously, the superior is the previous Acharya, the superior man. While physically manifest, that representative was the Diksha Guru for those who became his disciples. He received the order to initiate from his spiritual master in the line. This is the standard Vaishnav process. Only a disciple of a bona fide spiritual master, a guru, who has received, that spiritual master being a guru who has received the order to initiate new disciples from his own guru, only such a disciple of such a bona fide representative is properly initiated into a connection with the disciplic succession. To be properly initiated means to be initiated with Bhukti Lata Bij. Many such bona fide initiations took place from the summer of 1966 through most of 1977. Yet since that time, and quite to the contrary, the world has been flooded with improperly initiated disciples. All of this flotsam in the guise of pure devotion, is representative of corruption endemic to unauthorized initiations. Quote, One should always remember that a person who is reluctant to accept a spiritual master and to be initiated is sure to be baffled in his endeavor to go back to Godhead. One who is not properly initiated, may present himself as a great devotee, but in fact he is sure to encounter many stumbling blocks on his path of progress towards spiritual realization, with the result that he must continue his term of material existence without relief. Such a helpless person is compared to a ship without a rudder, for such a ship can never reach its destination." Unquote. This is from Prabhupada's purport to the Chaitanya Charitamrita Adi Lila, Chapter 1, Text 35. It hits the nail on the head. What were the seeds of today's massive corruption? What most people consider to be the Krishna movement is now a kaleidoscope of pandemonium and corruption. 
the root factor actuating all of this cult corruption, the key factor, is and remains the cult hierarchical fear effectively projected since the late 60s. The Ritviks are mostly an exception to this, but that should not be misconstrued to mean that fear is not used in those cults, cults in plural because Ritvik is anything but united. Two of the prominent leaders who joined the Ritvik cause early on were sannyasis before they did so. They were both quite heavy while they wore the saffron and carried their dunda of punishment. However, today's chief leader in the Ritvik is neither a former nor current sannyasi, so the psychic projection coming from those cults does not have that fear element backing it up. But such is not the case in either so-called Iskan or Neomut, however. These two corrupt entities are kept from cratering by a handful of upper echelon pretenders, many of whom are in saffron. Such is particularly the case in Neomut. Since so-called Iskan converted itself into the third transformation or Hinduization, its leaders have to be careful not to alienate the Hindu hodgepodge. Many, if not most Hindus, want no contact with such Western so-called renunciates in the alleged sannyas order, who are commonly called chapati collectors in India. In so-called Iskan and Neomut, they are all of the illegitimate variety and they convert their tendency toward overlarding sense objects into profit, adoration, distinction, and power. That has been going on for half of a century. They get off by doing this, although if they can sneak in some hanky-panky without getting caught, usually from enamored female disciples, they'll attempt to surreptitiously enjoy the best of both worlds for a while until unmasked. At starting corruption, it entered the movement early. Prabhupada was able to keep it in check in the beginning years, but by the mid-70s, he could no longer do so, at least not for any significant length of time. The first corruption was introduced into the movement by its first saffron man as a so-called perfectly Krishna conscious person. If he was that, he only stayed on that platform for, you for a few days at most. This, of course, was Kirtanananda, who blatantly disobeyed Prabhupada by not going to London after receiving sannyas in India. He was supposed to take advantage of a favorable Gaudiamat elderly woman there in London who wanted to assist whoever Prabhupada sent her in opening the first temple in Great Britain. As a fully Krishna conscious person, allegedly, Kirtanananda would likely have been successful. However, his false ego and attachment to his homosexual lover in the United States corrupted him. He simply used Heathrow as a transit point, flew to New York City, and then caused a major disturbance in that center. His lover, Hayagriva, did not try to dissuade this crazy man. Prabhupada bailed him out of Bellevue previously, but now urged his disciples to see to it that Kirtanananda was placed back into that asylum. They were unable to do so, of course, and Kirtanananda preached that they should give up their shaved heads, tilak markings, kunti beads, flags, robes, and all Eastern trappings. He enjoined them to preach to Americans dressed in Western garb without any Eastern or Vaishnava indicators. He was obviously corrupt 
but not everyone at that time could recognize it. Some became swayed, but most stood firm. Eventually, he was driven out of New York, spit upon by one of his godbrothers, and then took shelter of Hyagriva in Ohio. Kirtanananda eventually wound up on the streets of Cleveland wearing black robes with a black rod. And there he formed an organization which had the acronym of F period, U period, C period, K period, Y period, O period, U period. Corruption had entered in the late 60s through him, but it was checked. Then came the betrayal of four leaders who tried to close all of the temples, consolidating them into one center in Greenwich Village. These, le these men, led by Vishnu John and Brahmananda, Brahmananda's brother and another man, started a propaganda campaign which alleged that Prabhupada was actually God. This was cent per cent against what he preached from the beginning of his mission to the West. But they preached that this God was displeased with all of his devotees and wanted to now run his movement in an entirely different way from how he had previously established it. They then locked God into his room in Los Angeles. Although he was allowed visitors, which included disciples that did not fall for the ridiculous propaganda. In response, Prabhupada was able to get a dozen of them to become his first commissioners of the GBC, which was deputed to put down the rebellion of these four upstarts. In the one good thing, the GBC accomplished over the span of its entire duration, it checked and reversed the influence of the four renegades. He then awarded them the title of sannyas, but in doing so, dispersed them to different parts of America to start preaching centers, which two of them were very skilled at. None of these sannyasis remained true to the order over the full duration of the 70s, and that was no surprise. Like Kirtanananda, the corruption they allowed to enter into their astral bodies kept them from actually becoming dedicated renunciates. After it became known that he had engaged in illicit sex in Miami with one of his god sisters, Vishnu John committed suicide before Prabhupada even left the scene. Another of the four men screwed up in Africa, introducing all kinds of corruption into it while opposing a godbrother leader there, also now deceased, who fared hardly better. Is there a need to go into any more detail concerning this? Of course not. Although the details differed, the corruption became endemic, and it was all based upon disobeying the orders of the spiritual master. These five influential leaders, in a short span of years, lost the trust of the devotees at large due to corruption. As other saffron men started to appear in the early 70s, the same overlording tendencies came with them. This reached a low point, and the low point here would be exceeded not many years later. It reached a low point in early 1972 via the centralization conversion, Atreya Rishi's idea to consolidate all the movement's revenue into an investment scheme with his stock firm. Long story here, and we have written about it extensively. Eight of the leaders of his movement, all of them governing body commissars, devised a centralization plan in 1972, which again, was cent percent against Prabhupada's vision 
an already established paradigm. The whole thing was a manifestation of institutional corruption. And then a year after that, we reached the raw nerve issue. And what is the raw nerve issue? The introduction of the plain clothes pick. The vociferous emotional opinions of those who still believe this to have been and to be a great development in the movement. Those opinions are numerous, but numbers mean nothing. It was actually a corruption, although admittedly it brought in huge short-term revenue and increased both magazine and book distribution substantially. Prabhupada did not want it. This is proven beyond doubt. Consider this excerpt from a letter to a governing body commissioner dated February 14, 1973. Quote, regarding our Sankirtan party members dressing up as hippies in order to increase book distribution, this is not a very good plan. I am instructing Bali Mardan Maharaj that this should be stopped, that we should not give anyone cause to call us hippies. But the devotees can dress up in respectable clothes, like ladies and gentlemen, in order to distribute my literatures under special circumstances, but even this program should not become widespread." Unquote. Prabhupada says, quote, under special circumstances, unquote. Certainly what went down in late 1973 and then increased like a tsunami after all that throughout America and most of Europe, Certainly what went down did not meet the criterion of, quote, under special circumstances, unquote. And then there was this order from an excerpt to a letter to another governing body commissioner dated July 23, 1973. Quote, there is no objection to going in Western clothes in order to distribute my books it is not necessary that we always wear the robes, but we should always keep shika and tilak, unquote. Plain clothes was allowed under special circumstances and not to become widespread. However, even dressed as gentlemen in Western garb, the shika on the back of the head was to remain visible along with the T-lock on the forehead and the nose. None of this was observed. The plain clothes pick, the plain clothes pick was meant to hide the fact that devotees were distributing those books and magazines. It was cent per cent steeped in deception, which means that the plain clothes pick was a massive expansion of corruption in the Hare Krishna movement of Krishna consciousness. Consider the following excerpt from a letter to a temple president dated exactly on the same date as the previous excerpt I've just read. Quote, Regarding book distribution, everyone, including book distributors, must follow the standard regulations. Book distribution is preaching. It should not be thought of as done for money. It is executed as a preaching purpose." Unquote. The standard regulations are obviously referring to the wearing of the symbols of a devotee while in the public distributing transcendental literature. Picking the bone and bringing it home was all about revenue. Where was the preaching? How can you effectively preach to anyone when you are in disguise? You cannot, because that blows your cover. The objection may be raised that Karandar had sent a letter in late 1973 allegedly informing Prabhupada 
that the idea that the plainclothes collectors were being dishonest or hippies was not true. This Corundar letter is inaccessible if it even existed, but we do have a reply from Prabhupada in reference to it, potentially at least. Prabhupada is then said to have approved the plainclothes pick without the symbolic marks of a real devotee. However, he did not specifically say that in his reply to that inaccessible letter on this topic. As such, it cannot be so concluded, especially since his divine grace sent another letter to that governing body commissioner from mid-February 1973, quoted previously, in which he clearly states that he does not at all approve of the deception engaged in by those out on the pick. And then we have this important letter, which was dated January 9th, 1975, and it reads as follows, quote, Regarding the controversy about book distribution techniques, you are right. Our occupation must be honest. Everyone should adore our members as honest. If we do something which is deteriorating to the popular sentiments of the public in favor of our movement, that is not good. Somehow or other, we should not become unpopular in the public eye. If these dishonest, these dishonest methods must be stopped. It is hampering our reputation all over the world, unquote. In other words, the deceptive plain clothes pick with devotees not recognizable as Vaishnavs when they collect and distribute had actually been going on for 13 months by that time in the second week of January 75. If Prabhupada had actually approved of it the way they were doing it, that is over a year's time in which he could have changed his opinion. He did not. He agreed with the GBC man that the dishonest methods had to stop. They didn't, but he wanted them to stop. The movement had significantly degraded from the mode of goodness to the mode of passion during the period of the plain clothes pick. That passion was mixed with the psychopathic mode of ignorance because deception is integral to the mode of ignorance, not the passion. In the years before the plain clothes contamination, the devotees were straightforward when they went out on the streets in devotional garb with full insignia of Vaishnavism, chanted with drums and cartels, and simultaneously collected and distributed book magazines, sometimes books. That all changed radically beginning in the late 1973, but Prabhupada wanted a massive inversion in 1975, which he never got. Of course, he wanted it the whole time. He wanted completely honest dealings. Everything was to return to straightforward and honest methods. However, the corruption had set in. The passionate pickers liked to be in the mode of passion, quote unquote, for Krishna. They took pleasure in telling lies, quote unquote, for Krishna. It became institutionally authorized sense gratification. These were the kinds of people who were not philosophical, did not want to study the books, were not pensive and self-controlled. They were, whether initiated as Brahmins or not, not Brahminical in personality or character, nor were they inclined to change their characters to Brahminical. Nevertheless, Prabhupada started his movement in order to create Brahmins, not to create warriors, not to create superkarmis in the form of salesmen and saleswomen absorbed as quasi vaishyas out on the pick. The movement became corrupted 
by deviations in the 60s. We went over those. It became further corrupted by the centralization scheme in the early 70s. And then it became mega corrupted by the plain close pick, judged by the results. The short-term results of money and books were not balanced by a corresponding number of men actually making serious brahminical advancement. And as a side note, the female pickers were put on a pedestal due to dovetailing sexual allures, which were full of deception by their intrinsic nature. So those females could and did collect the most funds, and they were glorified in the Sankirtan newsletter for doing so. This feminization and degradation of the movement in the mid-70s set the stage for all of the massive corruption which soon followed it. The plain clothes pick was still going on in all of the centers in the Western world by the mid-70s. ISKCON Portland held out the longest, but in 1976 it also capitulated. The mode of passion was disguising itself as ecstasy, but no real spiritual advancement was being made by any of these people. Instead, they devolved into super karmis. In this age of Kali, or the age of hate, hypocrisy, corruption, and quarrel, the only remedial measure is that everyone should chant the holy name of the Lord individually and collectively if possible. Not to become expert grifters, which is what the pick turned them into. Tatvamasi. One of my senior god brothers happened to be the temple secretary at the Los Angeles Center during the heyday of the plain clothes pick. He corresponded to those who wrote to the center with inquiries, and this sometimes led to visits from those inquisitive people. One such inquisitive fellow was named Vokta John, according to this anecdote shared with me by that former, former temple secretary. It is an established fact that Prabhupada stayed at his Los Angeles headquarters for much of the duration of his physical manifestation. Sometimes these inquisitive people would be allowed to see him and ask him some questions. That would particularly be the case if they were either moneyed men or had achieved some kind of banal fame in Western society or both. According to the anecdote, Bhakta John had come into an inheritance fortune, so the temple president arranged for him to see Prabhupada. The idea was to secure a major donation from that room conversation Bhakta John would have with his divine grace. However, it did not play out like that. Bhakta John had a somewhat friendly relationship with the temple secretary, who through those exchange of letters led him eventually to visiting the Los Angeles Center. It would be natural that Bhakta John would meet with my godbrother after the Prabhupada interview in order to share how the meeting went. He did so. He then described the following. Thinking that Prabhupada would automatically reply in the affirmative, Bhakta John offered to donate his inheritance money to the movement. However, the offer was not accepted. Prabhupada instead replied, quote, My movement is very corrupt, unquote, and urged Bhakta John to use his money to spread Krishna consciousness as he, Bhakta John, saw fit. This is what the fellow shared with the temple secretary in charge of correspondence. Sure, it's anecdotal. That, however, does not mean that it did not take place as I've just described. It is being shared with you because your host speaker believes it to be true. I believe it to be true because it makes total sense. It also makes sense that Prabhupada was aware of the corruption. After all, he did not want the deceptive collection techniques to continue, but they did anyway. 
They did because the corrupt leaders wanted all of that money in order to control everyone under them in the hierarchy, including the vaunted collectors. The actual process in Buddha Yoga is to become self-realized by engagement in authorized devotional seva, which is integrally and intrinsically free from the corruption of the lower modes. The actual process is to become a Brahmin. Brahmins are honest. The institution will automatically become corrupt when those leading it are personally corrupt. The leaders running the plainclothes pick had to share in the corruption that was generated out in the field. And that corruption, that deception was massive. If the followers become corrupt, their institution and its governance will become corrupt. If you, the listener, the reader, however, preach against such institutional corruption, it will be exposed, it will be checked, and the whole thing will be terminated in due course of time. Now, when reform was possible, it's not now any longer possible, the institution could have been reformed and corrected. If every leader or anyone in power in any of the so-called Christian movements has become rascal, the institutions can only be run by rascals. The naive idea that Prabhupada was fully pleased with his movement in the end. What to speak of being impressed with it? That idea is not backed up by the record. He wasn't. He wanted and expected it to accomplish much more than it did. He did not approve of all the infighting. He wanted his leading secretaries to amicably take over for him so, they, so that he could simply concentrate on his books. Well, they did take over. But how they did so neither relieved nor pleased him. It was disturbing to him. Consider this excerpt from a letter to a leading secretary dated September 15, 1974. Quote, I am hearing so many things about management. My request is that until I am able to return to the USA, you all please work peacefully. At our next annual meeting at Mayapur, all complaints and counter complaints will be heard in the presence of all GBC and I will also be present. In the meantime, work peacefully without disturbing the situation." Unquote. And now we have this excerpt to a senior man in Los Angeles dated August 26, 1975. Quote, These reports are very much disturbing to me. How can I translate?" Unquote. And we have this excerpt, which was from a letter sent to all U.S. West Coast presidents dated November 5th, 1975. Quote, this is very bad. These reports about Japan are coming from all over the world. This is very disturbing to me. Their original face is coming out. This is not at all good, unquote. And this excerpt to a senior leader at that time, he's now a Neomat big man, dated November 13th, 1975, quote, but one thing is disturbing me. Do not deal with them by force. They are competent hands, so why fight with them? Do everything amicably. This fighting is going on everywhere. It is not a good sign, unquote. Prabhupada wanted Diksha Gurus in his movement by no later than 1975. We've established this fact many times in our previous articles and podcasts, so there's no need to reproduce the conclusive evidence of it here again. Prabhupada would have recognized genuine Diksha Gurus in the last days if his movement had produced them, but it didn't. It could not do so because corruption had entered too deeply into it by that time. It is not that so-called ISKCON first manifested in the spring of 1978 during the terrible GBC vote to create the zonal imposition. 
so-called ISKCON was already in the movement as a competitor thread by the mid-70s. It continued to suck nourishment from the real movement as the weed it was, stealing energy and choking it into the coup de grace. How could his divine grace have thought that it was a success or going to become one? Consider this excerpt from a room conversation with his disciples less than a year previous to his departure, dated December 26, 1976, quote, Now this movement has started because on this principle that why these rascals are not speaking in the parampara, that is my seed of starting this movement. I must start the movement. That is the impetus of this movement, that they must speak according to the parampara. And by the grace of Krishna, it has become to some extent successful, unquote. Nothing radically changed in the next 11 months for the better. Everything got worse, although this was not recognized at the time. It is recognized now by most of you. Quote, to some extent, unquote, was applicable at the end of 1976, and it remained so throughout 1977. If anything, that limited success to some extent degraded in the final year. We should recognize where it was successful and where it was not. We need to know the history, but we cannot know it with a vitiated or biased memory. We must accept the right narrative. That right narrative is being presented to you in our articles, videos, and podcasts for many years now, indeed decades. Study it. Assimilate it, spread it, realize it, and realize what needs to be done now. As per the excerpt that I've just read, following the parampara is this principle. Prabhupada was the pure representative of the parampara. He still is. Following him means recognizing his authority, his spiritual authority. Recognizing his authority means obeying him. His leaders were not doing this in the final days. Indeed, there is strong evidence that a handful of them were even poisoning him. What to speak of those who could not see what was going down? The poison issue was discovered much later, but all of his sincere and serious disciples should have spotted what was transpiring no later than 1976. Only a small handful of initiated, initiated disciples did, however. Corruption had entered his movement in a very big way, quote, to some extent successful, unquote. This was anything but a ringing endorsement of the movement's progress. In the last week of 1976, Prabhupada was not very satisfied with the accomplishments and progress of his branch of the Hare Krishna movement. This is clear from that excerpt. It is naive to believe that he did not recognize the corruption. And this was indicated just before he departed physical manifestation. Quote, Please don't leave me here. Keep me surrounded. That will encourage me. You keep me surrounded and chant Hare Krishna. Chant Hare Krishna softly all together. Do not leave. Now I have become poisonous. Everyone is avoiding me. Things are deteriorating. What is to be done? What is the use? Everything is frustrated." Unquote. On October 25th, 1977, one of Prabhupada's personal attendants contacted the GBC for Southern California by phone with this stunning message. That GBC then sent an alert memo to all temple presidents entitled, Urgent, Urgent, Urgent. This excerpt, which I've just read from Prabhupada's statements to that personal attendant who was with him in India, was part of the conversation 
between that personal attendant and the governing body commissioner in America. The immediate prolong to it first needs to be explored. Earlier in the month, many of Prabhupada's leading secretaries had come to Vrindavan and Raman Reti in order to see Prabhupada. As most of you know from the photos of him at that time, those photos not distributed to the devotees at large until after he left the scene, those photos of him at that time showed that his physical condition was draconian. He was all skin and bones, and it was difficult to figure out how anyone in that condition could possibly still be alive. Yet he was, in no small part due to his mystic power. Those leaders begged him not to depart his earthly manifestation, and as such, after they begged and cried, he agreed to stay. He was in the process of leaving prematurely according to his physical condition. But he acquiesced to their request and agreed to stay. He had said that he would live to 100 years of age. He had said that he would translate the Padma Purana. He had said that he would translate Mahabharata. Undoubtedly, these translations would have included important, important purports. He had said that he would translate Vedanta Sutra. None of this turned out to be the case. In point of fact, he did not even finish translating the Bhagavatam, only making it through the first few chapters of the 10th canto. His agreement to remain physically manifest was contingent upon his leaders changing their ways. They did not. Instead, they went back to their zones and playgrounds in the Western world in order to overlord with their figurehead Acharya still physically present in order to keep the situation from degenerating in their overlording. That was always the modus operandi since the mid-70s in the name of giving Prabhupada relief from the management so he could concentrate upon his writing. Here is an excerpt from a letter to a leading secretary dated October 16, 1975, in which Prabhupada makes it clear that his leading men are not giving him the relief he wanted. Quote, My only grievance is that I appointed GBC to give me relief from the management, but on the contrary, complaints and counter-complaints are coming to me. Then how my brain can be peaceful? Unquote. In other words, they were not managing the movement as he expected them to do, and devotees were complaining both bitterly and voluminously about their mismanagement. Corruption had entered and the leading secretaries were not uprooting it. On the contrary, many of them were benefiting from it, either directly or indirectly. When Prabhupada says in this excerpt, excerpt quote, on the contrary, unquote, it means that he was being even more burdened rather than relieved by the mismanagement being enacted in his name. This, at least in part, led to him becoming emaciated not long after this letter in late 1975 and then soon afterwards showing all of the signs of imminent departure. Those signs proved to be ominous and true as only three weeks later from the date of that urgent memo to all temple presidents, Prabhupada indeed left the scene permanently. And only four months after that, ultra horrific corruption entered. Of course, we're referring to the zonal imposition of March 1978. Against Prabhupada's orders of regular guru, 11 GBC men, with the imprimatur of the GBC vote, divided the world into 11 fiefdoms in which they were undeservedly worshipped as Uttamas. That pretension on their parts was only reversed in the mid-80s, replaced by another transformation, which did not actually address the root issues of the first major corruption of the zonal takeover. However, 
A corrupt splinter group emerged before this in the late 70s and early 80s. We are referring to Neomat, of course. It was and remains corrupt in two obvious ways, although that should not be misinterpreted to mean that those are its limits of corruption. Swami B. R. Sridhar began to assemble malcontents from the second echelon of Prabhupada's movement. Those frustrated leaders were reacting to what was going down in the zonal imposition, which did not afford them the opportunity to become gurus themselves. With the manifestation of the Neomat Splinter Group, they received sannyas initiations from Swami B. R. Sridhar. This gave them a status and an according opportunity to become gurus. With only one exception, all of them took new names from Swami B. R. Sridhar. That means he reinitiated them. There was corruption embedded in this because Prabhupada never did that when he gave sannyas to his disciples. When he gave one of his devotees sannyas, the only change, a very minor one, was that the accolade of bhakti was to be put in front of the initiated name that the initiated disciple had received previously. One example of this is the title Bhakti Swarup Damodar, who previously was simply Swarup Damodar. The other corruption was even more astounding. Prabhupada's basic philosophical preaching is that we're all originally with Krishna in a spiritual body of form and activity before falling into the material world of samsara. It was radically reversed by Niyamat. This deviation was major and very corrupt. It had a deeply rooted corrupting influence on every devotee who bought into the Niyamat splinter group. Gaudiamat preaches that the jiva was never in the spiritual world. Prabhupada preached exactly the opposite. There are many ramifications of this irreconcilable difference, and we shall not go into any of that here. It has been covered extensively by myself in many of our previous videos, audios, and written works on our websites or on Facebook. If you want to learn those details, feel free to seek out those posts, because again, there's many of them. So-called ISKCON had manifested a new, unauthorized, and very huge corruption in the form of the zonal acharya imposition. The institution uprooted it, mostly, in the mid-80s, replacing it with another concoction that was also corrupt, but in a different way the Collegiate Compromise. This eventually, at around the turn of the century, was replaced by a third transformation, the Hinduization of so-called ISKCON. The corruption of Neomat added to the mix as a splinter group. But there was more corruption to come. Indeed, you can now find all kinds of colorful patterns in the all-pervading manifestations of the so-called Christian movement via the kaleidoscope of many cult corruptions. A later corruption manifested in the last month of the 80s and during various ebbs and flows, the Ripvik movement contributed to this other unauthorized yet colorful pattern of options. None of these were desired or ordered by His Divine Grace, Prabhupada. None of them were ever approved by Him, and none of them are approved by Him now. They are all colorful make-shows of different patterns of Sahajism vying with one another for supremacy, and they're all corrupt. The first two, so-called Iskana and Neomat, are semblances, known as Apasadharmas. They are not what Prabhupada authorized, and they are bogus. However, they present a semblance of the real thing. Ritvik, on the other hand, is a chalatharma, a cheating arrangement from its very beginning. Maya has arranged to call it by the essence of its cheating. You cannot accept a Diksha Guru who is no longer physically manifest, but the Ritviks opine otherwise without any spiritual authority to do so. 
there was a point reached many decades ago where the cult corruption could no longer be eradicated. When the 11 great pretenders loaded the centers with their own improperly initiated disciples, mostly replacing Prabhupada's genuinely initiated disciples in the process, the whole thing became incorrigible and became incorrigible very quickly. Such was the case, and the two splinter groups just mentioned simply compounded the corruption. You can put the pieces of the puzzle together for your own edification and realization at this time, but Humpty Dumpty himself cannot be put together again in a way that is free from corruption. Genuine Krishna consciousness cannot be spread in anything even closely resembling what is supposed to be Lord Chaitanya's Hare Krishna movement by such corrupt institutions as so-called Iskan, Neomat, and Ritvik. The colossal hoax, known as the fabricated so-called Iskan movement, is a pseudo-spiritual scam. If you are enamored by the kaleidoscope of the patterns it offers within the narratives it spins, that is your misfortune. However, if you reject all of its patterns, the kaleidoscope of cult corruption may still attract you with different colorful pictures in the form of the flawed Neomat cult or the concoction of the various centrifugal rhythmics. If you have listened to and or read this podcast and its transcription from the beginning to end, you cannot claim that you were not warned. Sadeva Samyam.